Welcome everyone. Uh, thank you for uh, joining RT21. Uh, this is a panel about hardware in the loop simulation and the future of grid and microgrid controls with Renewable. Uh, my name is Sudipta Chakraborty. I am the Director of Energy Systems at Opal RT, and I will be the panel moderator for this particular panel. So in this panel, oops, okay. So we have four panelists in this panel, uh, Dr. Wei Sun from University of Central Florida, uh, Mr. Devendra Vishwakarma from Larson and Turbo, uh, Mr. Uh, Dr. Ulrich Moens from Siemens, and Dr. Fred Wang from University of Tennessee, Knoxville. Thank you uh, everyone for joining this panel. We are looking forward to an exciting discussion today. So before jumping to the panelists, I would like to give you a quick a brief on what this panel is about and what we are trying to get from this panel. So as we all know, the power system is going through an evolution right now, uh, evolution right now with renewables, especially the integration of renewable and distributed energy resources at the distribution level is posing different new challenges such as reverse power flows, protection coordination, voltage regulation. So we also have close interactions between the transmission and the distribution systems due to the frequency and the stability impacts uh, from variable generation resources. Loss of inertia happening due to the non-synchronous generation such as PV and wind. We also have the impact of loss of generation at the distribution level impacting the transmission operations. We also are seeing more complex system planning and operational needs because of the security and resiliency requirements. Uh, due to the availability of large number of monitoring and control points. We also seeing integration of non-dispatchable DERs, controllable loads, energy storage at both the transmission and distribution level. Seeing new concepts such as virtual power plants and microgrids and many more. With this new types of power system paradigms, also the validation requirements and the challenges are getting more and more complex. We now require multi-time scale validations for electromagnetic and electromechanical transients. And we have different types of analysis such as EMT, transient stability, QSTS, et cetera. We also seeing the capability to determine or also need the capability to determine the impact of the fast switching converters. We also have to have the uh, capture of interactions between the TND networks. We require co-simulations of power communication and cyber layers because now the whole energy system is becoming a large cyber physical system. Hardware in the loop testing is used for development, validation, integration of new controls and protections uh, for the power systems and power electronics, because it can capture the closed loop interaction between the smart devices and the power network. It can validate the scalability of new grid control and optimization approaches. And finally, it can analyze the impact of the cyber and the physical events and the real devices uh, connected to those uh, simulated systems and their effect on the power systems operations. A couple of pictures shown here. The top one was just showing a wide scale implementation or wide scale control implementation and validation using hardware in the loop. Whereas the lower picture was showing an application where hardware in the loop can be used for control hardware in the loop type of validation of the microgrid controls, both primary, secondary, and tertiary controls, as well as if you can uh, add an amplifier to that, you can actually test the real devices connected to the simulated system. So with that background, uh, we'll actually go to the panel. Before going there, uh, here is the agenda for this panel. So we'll have a short presentation from each of the panelists. The presentation will be around four or five minutes each. After those presentations is over, we'll have some moderated panel discussions led by me. Uh, once we are done with those two, then we'll use the audience Q&A to answer your questions. For audience Q&A, I was hoping to use the uh, direct uh, talk to you guys, so it will be more uh, live. So please use the raise hand icon in your Zoom. And then once I see that, I will unmute you and then you can ask your question. And then from there on, our panelists can answer depending on your question. We'll try to accommodate as many questions as possible, but if we miss you or if you have some difficulty in the queue, uh, in the uh, directly asking the questions, please use the Q&A tab. And then we can either address it during this uh, panel or we it later through email. With that, I will actually stop sharing my screen and I will request uh, our first panelist, uh, Dr. Wei San from uh, University of Central Florida.
Okay, let me share my screen. Can you see my screen? Yes. Okay. Well, uh, thank you, Sipta. Uh, appreciate you uh, bring up this panel and, and all the attendees uh, panelists. So my name is Wei Sun. I'm an associate professor from University of Central Florida. So today as a kick off the panel presentation, I wanna share some of our ongoing uh, projects which focus on real-time control and operation of large scale power system with uh, millions of uh, British devices, as well as with the focus on the role of hardware in the loop uh, testing in, in a project. Um, yeah, a little bit about myself. Um, my research interest has been focused on resilient security renewable uh, particularly on system recovery, restoration from natural disaster uh, failures, uh, cyber attacks, as well as renewable integrations and a microgrid has been leading multiple um, projects funded by a federal agency, Department of Energy, National Science Foundation, as well from the utility. Um, I'm also co-chairing to uh, one working group as well, one task force on power system restoration and with one particular with renewable energy resources. So today I'm gonna to share uh, our experience in three projects. First on this renewable integration, large scale system, second on a separate security, and the last one on uh, microgrid management system. So the first one is the, funded by US Department of Energy, Solar Energy Technology Office, Energize Program with the collaboration in, in real Hawaii, Duke, Siemens, and OPRT. On this project, there's a three main area. Uh, when we talk about the large scale system as well as extremely high penetration of solar, and how we developed the test system. In this project, we developed a million node system. And then how we have a credible 100% PV penetration criteria. And the last one is how we develop and testing the real-time control and operation of distributed approaches. So the first for the one million node system, we use the synthetic network by, developed by NREL, the one in the Bay Area, the other one in North Carolina. When we have these two system, we analyze and grab and, and 10 of the 100,000 node system with representative urban, suburban, industrial, and rural area. Once have the system, and next one is to have a credible PV profiles and working with industry members, Duke Energy and Hawaii, we're able to have this uh, PV scenarios as well as PV penetration hosting capacity to find the worst uh, scenarios. And when we have the test system, the data is available, and the next is to we extend the open DSS to the multi-agent open DSS and then enable us to test the different distributed architect and to enable uh, different ADMS functions like decimation, OPF, recovery configuration, but in a distributed way. So with this algorithm R&D developed, the next question is how we validate to test this algorithm that's probably in the real environment. And OPRT and all hardware in the loop testbed is really uh, served very well for this purpose. In this project, we have two tests, but one is at the UCF with majority is controller hardware in the loop. And the second is in the NREL, they have both controller and a power hardware in the loop. So one example that we wanna share is by collaborating with OPRT and, and NREL, we developed this 100,000 node system in the OPRT environments and to implement the distributed control that algorithm developed in this project. And by testing the algorithm in all project real-time environments that we can compare the performance in the real system environment as well as in the open source, open DSS. So that's the first one to look at that, how we do the large scale system testing. And the second project is on a cybersecurity also by US Department of Energy, Solar Energy Office. In this particular project, the idea is when we have a large penetration of distributed energy resources, especially at a grid age and how we develop cybersecurity and algorithms, especially using distributed architect and with the distributed the control information exchange as well as the uh, optimization. And we're trying to bring up the holistic approaches for a variety of layers of the uh, intrusion detection, resilient control that it can be used to enable distributed intelligence as well as the data-driven machine learning algorithm. So now in this project, the hardware in the loop is also play a very interesting role and also very important. The first of course, open source. All the algorithm developed in a university or the lab environments can be using open source software that to test the feasibility. So next is the, in this project with a lot of power hardware in the loop test bed available, we're working with OPRT uh, achieving this scalar network, developed the Exata network. 
So with this, you can model both the power and the communication network in one simulator, and then you can do the real-time simulation of the cyber physical interaction and interdependence. And of course, uh, with everything tested, we were testing the real environment with the Duke Mohali microgrid test bed. And the last one I want to share is the UCF campus microgrid. Uh, with the UCF campus model as a one line diagram, we first model in the O4RT system and then model in the Siemens microgrid management system, MGMS, which is essentially scaled down EMS. So, with the OT system running and also running in O4RT, so the idea is when you have a live system running, and OPRT will behave as a live system, provide the data through the DMP3 connected to the MGMS system. And then you can really mimic what's in the control center you're monitoring the system and have a data flowing. And, and in this one, you can see that's the capability of the OPRT or hardware in the loop to mimic a real system, provide the live data. So that's a, a very quick three uh, project overview, and, and we can continue discussion later in the uh, panel discussion. Thank you. Thanks, Wei. Uh, that's a nice presentation. So we'll jump to Mr. Uh, Devendra Vishwakarma from LNT. You can share your screen and unmute. I can unmute. So. Thank you, Sudhita. <clears throat> uh, so what I've been presenting uh, as a case example of uh, hardware in loop uh, simulation used for the product development and testing towards digitization of grid. That's the topic. And uh, the case example which I will be taking you through will be for a renewable power plant controller that uh, we have been building at LNT. Uh, <clears throat> little bit about me. Uh, so I work as a uh, CTO for. Uh, the power transmission and distribution uh, digital solutions at uh, Lawson and Tubo, uh, which is a, uh, one of the largest MNC out of India uh, and one of the largest CPC and renewable developer in, uh, in uh, many parts of Asia. Uh, I'm based out of Dallas, uh, 21 plus years experience uh, specializing in product management, solution architecture, and business consulting in the area of PTND. Uh, I have led various uh, microgrid projects uh, in USA, Europe, and in China as well, uh, and also developed business cases architecture requirements uh, for uh, many utilities in the area of uh, DR management, microgrids, DNS, and uh, business intelligence and analytics solutions. Uh, with that, let's get into the <coughs> HIL uh, for the product development. Uh, so the case example, what I'm talking about, uh, I'm going to walk you through will be the renewable power plant controller development. Uh, and let's start with some of the key challenges what we face when we are talking about uh, development of controllers, uh, which are supposed to be used as uh, uh, main devices or the secondary tertiary controllers for the uh, large renewable power plants as well as hybrid power plant controls. Uh, for wind, solar, uh, energy storage, and those kind of stuff. Uh, one of the major challenges, uh, it's impossible to bring all the equipment at one place to perform the product testing You know, uh, for large power plants. For example, we are talking about hundreds of megawatts of solar or hundreds of megawatts of wind power plants or very really large energy storage systems. Uh, so uh, how do we do our product testing validation and verification of the solution. Uh, also, it's very difficult uh, from time to time for us to mimic the actual site conditions with respect to the local weather, impact of weather on generation, and those kind of things for the renewable uh, power plants. And <clears throat> last but not the least, testing of the actual power plant network uh, characteristics, including production devices and other primary controllers and their dynamic and transient nature. You know, so these were the challenges which we were faced with, and that's where we uh, partner with Opelati uh, as our first choice to go with for the uh, uh, HIL testing uh, and simulation. So what we did, we developed a detailed renewable power plant uh, model in MATLAB, and then we imported it into Opelati, which is like piece of cake because it's very seamlessly integrated solution uh, from that perspective. 
Uh, we are using uh, Opel RC in our labs, uh, not only for product testing, but also for uh, conducting the factory acceptance test, uh, uh, doing the certification testing, validation, and all those kind of things as well. Uh, what we did also, we not only modeled the entire uh, renewal power plants uh, in uh, Opel RT uh, for the HIL testing or the HIL simulation, we also uh, did the configuration and simulation of uh, various uranium data, uh, the power electronics behavior uh, for the inverters, transformers, measurement devices. Uh, we use multiple protocols uh, specifically for this uh, particular product. Uh, we are using Modbus and uh, IC104 uh, 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 protocol, and there we are simulating the IEDs uh, for that in Opel RT with their actual site uh, for, for parameters. So what we do is that uh, while we are testing it for a generic uh, purpose, we also use actual site parameters and we are able to configure those uh, as part of uh, HIL simulation in Opel RT. With this, what did we achieve? You know, uh, when we look at uh, uh, the benefits of uh, using the HIL, particularly for the product uh, development life cycle, uh, this HIL testing platform with Opel RT, it enabled us uh, to test a large scale power plant in the realistic simulated uh, environment uh, where we did, uh, uh, we used the HIL setup uh, to investigate the integration of uh, distributed resources, next generation SCADA systems and power management units there. Uh, the power plant model, uh, uh, it really helped us uh, from the perspective that we no longer needed the real system or the prototype systems. Uh, there we all uh, were able to model it in uh, the Opel RT system itself. Uh, we developed the plant model uh, that takes as a, a real plant, which gives the flexibility to control field parameters like the PV inverter generation profile, circuit breaker controls, in uh, production and control, inverter settings, and all those kind of stuff. Uh, this did help us uh, in testing uh, the, and the real-time monitoring of the all I.O. signals for PPC during uh, various uh, safety acceptance testing and all those kind of things. Uh, <clears throat> with that, what it gave us was the flexibility to modify change the parameters of these devices during uh, the real-time for uh, performing the accurate pre-test scenarios uh, uh, in very little time. Uh, it helped us get the best uh, test coverage by like all positive and negative testing scenarios. It helped us in uh, identification of uh, issues with the controllers uh, in very early stages. Uh, and that's how it helped us uh, uh, release uh, new generation power plant controllers for the hybrid uh, uh, power plants and renewable power plants. Uh, last but not the least, Industrial protocols, the capabilities for us, because that's very important uh, from the product development and product testing, validation, verification perspective, uh, the broad spectrum of protocols, industry protocols, which uh, Opel RT supports, uh, that helped uh, us uh, 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 test various devices. Uh, with the same box, we were able to test up to 100 uh, or 99 uh, slaves uh, using Modbus. We use IC104 protocols. Uh, various IDs and all those kind of things. So, with uh, I would say the HIL, uh, it really reduced our time and effort to do the validation and verification uh, almost by 40%. Uh, what we used to do uh, uh, in, uh, let's say, four months, we were able to do it in two and a half months and uh, yet achieve the uh, same results uh, while. Uh, uh, doing the product testing and uh, releases of uh, the solution there. So with that, I will hand it over back to you, Sudipta. Thank you, uh, Devendra. This is a nice presentation. Yeah, we are glad that it is helping uh, you in your product development. So the next speaker, I'll request Dr. Ulrich Menz from Siemens. Yes, I'm happy to take over. Thanks, Sudipta. So I will give you a very quick overview of our work for driving renewable integration transmission systems and with a special focus here on Hawaii. This is a joint project also funded by the US Department of Energy, 
uh, with many partners that you can see here on the slide. And I would like to thank actually all the partners. Opal RG is also here, uh, part of the team. Um, and of course, also our funding agency. I'll start with a little background about myself. Uh, I'm a principal key expert for control systems and have a global responsibility to drive innovation here for Siemens. And I also have a role as a head of autonomous systems and control of a research group here in our research center, Siemens Technology in Princeton, New Jersey. Um, I'm combining three different areas with my background and expertise. I started with a PhD in automatic control. I looked into distributed control and, and distributed optimization techniques. Um, and also over the last 15 years in many different optimization problems that initially look uh, very difficult to solve, but with some engineering insights, you find a solution, which um, obviously since these problems are intractable, are not optimal, but they do a job as they are needed in, in industry. Um, before joining Siemens, I worked for another company developing solar inverters and was responsible there for both the control and the system architecture. So I have a pretty deep understanding of inverters. And also since I'm with Siemens, I'm also working on grid forming inverter control, also a big topic that I'm sure many of you are familiar with. And last but not least, um, I have a background in power systems. So integration of many inverters and as many of you are aware, uh, integrating renewables into power systems and driving sustainability to 100% um, requires of course the combination of inverters how to many inverters play together and how to control all this together. Um, as we have done in, in Siemens along this journey, and it started um, close to 10 years back when I joined Siemens, uh, looking into operating power systems with high renewable integration, um, and in particular looking into microgrids at the beginning, where we can operate them at least for a few hours during the day um, with only wind and, and solar generation. We started with a project on Galapagos Island that you can see here on the left-hand side. Um, where I was responsible for the control architecture in 2018 is when it went into operation. So it's running now since three years. Um, but when you develop these solutions, of course, you have to think of how can you develop scalable solutions that work in large scale systems, like at the very end that you see here at the top right, maybe the US system or the European continental system. So the solutions we develop in small systems or we, we start learning in small systems, we want to make sure they are scalable. And of course, we want to test them in a scalable setting. Like these small islands like Galapagos, uh, you can of course do a hardware test, uh, you can go in a lab, you can do a functional acceptance test, but at some point you have to scale it up to larger systems. And this is where hardware in the loop and Opal RT really comes in handy. And this is the project you see in the center, which is Hawaii. Uh, what we are doing in this project is we want to demonstrate N minus one security of a power system with 100% generation from wind and solar. N minus one security means that the system can withstand any single failure, loss of a power plant, loss of a power line without creating major blackouts in the system. And this is of course very important. Today we are used to have a system which is N minus one secure. We have outages here in the US, but this is mostly when you have many outages or many failures in your system at happening at the same time, like Hurricane Ida that we have seen here two weeks ago. Yeah, but N minus one security is a, a basic requirement for power system operation. And as probably many of you are aware, when you go from conventional generation to power electronic based generation, wind, solar, battery storage, uh, there are some fundamental changes in the power system dynamics. And that's exactly what we want to demonstrate here. The solution we are developing is an operator support system, which does an online adaptation of the controller parameters of the different assets and thereby maximizes N minus one security. So the question was, how can we actually demonstrate this? Yeah, it's clear that we cannot demonstrate it on the real island of Hawaii because you may cause any outages, right? And as Devandra was saying earlier, testing things in a simulation in the hardware and loop test bed is a perfect way to, to drive innovation. And that's actually what we did. What you see on the left-hand side is a demonstrator we are building up. The project hasn't finished yet. Um, we have a real-time simulation of the system from Hawaii in Opal RT. Uh, we have a commercial spectrum power seven energy management system from Siemens. And then you see in the top the operator support system, which consists also of Seagard dynamic security assessment, also product from Siemens and dynamic security optimization, which is our optimization tool that we use to stabilize the system. Um, and then left hand side, you also see uh, the, the size of the system. So we're looking here at Big Island. It is actually a significant system with about 200 megawatt of total uh, load generation, of course, is, is higher in total. Um, and one of the biggest challenges that we worked on with Opal RT is how do you actually model such a system of this size realistically? 
Uh, and what we did, we, we caught up right here with um, Hawaiian Electric. So we got the PSSE model from Hawaiian Electric, which is their model they use today for planning for grid extension studies. And then as you see here on the slide, together with our partners, especially with Opal RT, converted this from PSSE model, which is a root mean square model, into first a SYNCAL model, which is another tool from Siemens that is running both RMS and EMT, electromagnetic transient simulations, and then into SIMScape. The SYNCAL model is required for our dynamic security assessment. The SIMScape model is then used to program the Opal RT, the, the EMT simulation in eMegaSim. Um, and you, what you can see here on this figure is a comparison that we did between these four different models. So you see the PSSE model, RMS, the SYNCAL model, RMS, the SYNCAL model, EMT, and then the uh, SIMScape or SIMPower Systems model, also in EMT. And you see there is a very good match in the dynamics. You see in the EMT uh, simulations, there are the 60 Hertz oscillations that we know they are coming from the DC part of the state of dynamics of the synchronous generator. So this is all fine. This is something we expect when we do this kind of simulations. But it was a hard part of the work for the first year of this project. And just showing you a very quick uh, glimpse into the results of this project so far. As I said, it's not finished yet. We're looking in different scenarios for the load, noon case, evening case, night case, as you see in the top. We're looking at different scenarios concerning generation. We call this here system non-synchronous penetrations or the percentage of wind and solar generation in your system um, with 100%, 90%, 80%. So we have mixed scenarios. And we look at different contingencies that you see at the bottom, loss of synchronous machines, loss of power lines, and so on. And you see in all these cases, this optimization that we are developing is perfectly stabilizing the system from systems that you always see on the left-hand side, which are oscillating heavily into systems that are much more dense. And this is exactly what we want. And thank you very much again, Sudipta. And I'm happy to take more questions later on or offline by email. Thank you so much, Ulrich. And uh, it's a nice, yeah. It's glad to be partner in this particular project. So thank you. And now we move to Dr. Fred Wang. Uh, Dr. Wang, you can share your screen. Okay. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Okay. Give me a second. Control. We can see a screen, but in a, in a uh, like yeah, hard I need to, I need, I need to, I need to move this. Okay. Yep. Good. Okay. Um, uh, good afternoon. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, flexible microgrid and DR controller validation with hardware and uh, HRL testbed. Um, a little bit about myself. Um, Uh, my name is Fred Wang. I'm a professor at the uh, University of Tennessee in Knoxville. I'm also affiliated with Oak Ridge National Lab. Uh, I'm also uh, part of the uh, NSF DOE uh, ERC current. Uh, before uh, UTK and Oak Ridge, I also worked in GE for 10 years, uh, eight years in CPAS Virginia Tech. Uh, my research interest is mainly on power electronics and also its application to power systems as well as uh, transportation. Uh, currently, I'm uh, leading uh, several uh, DOE RPE projects on microgrid and uh, DERs. Uh, one of the projects uh, is sponsored by RPE uh, to develop a flexible microgrid with dynamic boundary and uh, multiple grid interfaces. Uh, this one is in collaboration as, uh, ser uh, with se several uh, partners. Uh, it is a microgrid in Chattanooga Airport in Tennessee. Uh, it has solar and gas generator, battery energy storage. Uh, the unique thing with this is that uh, during the islanded operation, uh, we can uh, change the boundary dynamically based on the available assets. Uh, like showing here, we also have uh, several interface points uh, we can connect to rather than just uh, fixed boundary points. And uh, so we start with uh, this uh, branch here. Okay, maybe I go to a pointer. And uh, 
once uh, we see a need, we can expand and uh, expand and uh, expand. And if uh, we don't have enough uh, the uh, resource, we can start to shrink, right? Uh, that's uh, the uniqueness of this microgrid. Um, another project uh, is sponsored by DOE. Uh, it's called uh, Asynchronous Microgrid for Flexible CHP. The idea is that uh, the CHP plant can be connected to the grid uh, with uh, a power conditioning system. This is a power electronics based. And uh, it can be used to control, to support the grid needs uh, if necessary. Uh, one of the key features, of course, in addition to power electronics, uh, power conditioning system is uh, the, the controller. Uh, we call it flexible uh, CHP central controller, very similar to the microgrid controller I just mentioned. Uh, a similar project uh, we are developing, uh, sponsored also by DOE, uh, is again a synchronous microgrid, but in this case, instead of a CHP, which is, uh, if you are not familiar, it's combined heat and power, uh, this is a manufacturing plant. Right? Um, the manufacturing plant can have a flexible load and source uh, like uh, you know, renewable or battery or traditional uh, power source uh, connected to the PCS again to the grid. Uh, again, we will control the whole thing as a microgrid and we can change the boundary and change uh, the, the perform uh, the, 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 the functions uh, of the source and loads. Uh, obviously, uh, to do this, it's important to test uh, the controller and the system. Um, the previously, uh, the panelists already justified why we need that. So here I'm just showing the example of uh, the, uh, the testing for microgrid controller on OPRT. Uh, in this case, uh, we have this microgrid central controller and uh, several local controller. Uh, which are real, right? In this case, they are uh, an I based controller and uh, uh, compare real in that case. Uh, then we model the system uh, in OPRT and uh, then we can test our controller. Um, I don't know how well this will work. I actually have a, a video uh, that uh, uh, shows uh, the testing procedure that uh, in a visualized uh, manner. Uh, in this case, I want to uh, call your attention to this microgrid central controller function. You can see many, many different uh, functions. Uh, green indicating these functions are actually being enabled in this case. Uh, uh, basically, we look at uh, this uh, a boundary case, uh, once it's uh, zero, it will be reconnected. So start from uh, uh, islanded case to grid connected case. So this is an example of using OPRT to test. Uh, the nice thing about this real-time tester is, as I showed, you can simultaneously test many of these uh, functions just like a real controller. Uh, a lot of times in simulation, you, it's not easy to do that. Um, in addition to the uh, uh, HRL uh, tests uh, using a real-time uh, uh, simulator like OPRT, uh, at UTK we also have a so-called uh, hardware test bed, which is another way to test the control and the system. It, it's a test bed based on the power electronics converter. Uh, the, the, the unique thing about this is, of course, uh, uh, we can uh, be more realistic, uh, especially with converters, the multi-time scale can be considered uh, already. Uh, again, uh, we have the real uh, hardware uh, for controllers and uh, then the hardware test bed will uh, model the system. Uh, with that, uh, we can uh, have a similar uh, testing. Uh, in this case, uh, it's another uh, visualization of the testing. Uh, again, started with islanded uh, case and uh, we can select uh, which uh, grid point to connect. Right? In this case, we have G1 or G4, we chose G1. And uh, so the controller will uh, run in real time and uh, the, you can see the, the grid and the microgrid 
will eventually be connected, and at this point, uh, it's a reconnection point uh, based on the available uh, source and the load need. And so uh, after a while, you can see when this angle well, goes to zero, it will uh, be uh, reconnected. Uh, so uh, that's basically my presentation. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Wang. So, yeah, I think we have very like a, yeah, even though we have only five minutes each, but we had a pretty detailed presentation from each of you. Thank you so much. So maybe we can do some moderated Q&A initially, and then we can go to the attendees. So first question for uh, you, Dr. Sun, uh, like you mentioned about the large scale validation of the grid for your energized project. So I was just curious, like why you need that? Like why you need the large scale validation? That's first. Uh, question to you and then second question is that like what is your experience like when you are validating say between two softwares and things like that sure yeah uh first of all the goal of the project or the the dual energize program is really looking at not only high penetration of dr but they really wanted to look at whether the distributed approach is scalable so that's why we need to look at a large scale system or extremely large scale so by saying, saying that, um, I think most of us uh, 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 are their standard IEEE uh, transmission test system or distribution test feeder, uh, but for realistic, the large scale, when we talk about the hundred thousand or even millions, there's not, not a lot. So in this project, based on our experience, is we're looking at the public available, which is from Unreal, they provide synthetic network. However, the network, if you look at the, the, which is actual system, one is in Bay Area, the other is in North Carolina, it's not easy to separate the size of which you want, because when we look at the, the, the feeder or lateral, there's a many, uh, some is open, open uh, connecting points, some is tight switches. So when you want to extract the size system you want, also representative as a rural or urban or, or industrial, that's need effort. So first question is the whether we have a test system to provide a benchmark. Well, the second is that when you have those system, uh, typically they give you only the characteristic of, of a system and not uh, PV scenarios. So how to get the credible, realistic, which you have to work with the industry members. Of course, there is some uh, ongoing activity, uh, I believe from working group, National Lab Utility provide some uh, data without sensitive operatory information, but still, that part is, is uh, I believe, is the difficulties. The last one, I, I believe, is the uh, software. Um, for the system, as we can see today, there's many different uh, uh, simulators. Some is open source, like SIME, OpenDS, Equilabd, some is commercial. And to convert in different format of data into operating environments, that's the tremendous effort. Through the collaboration with the OPRT and, and Unreal, they have this uh, open source DDO2, but it's not a perfect one fit for all. There's a lot of uh, debugging need to be involved. So how, how to convert in different uh, uh, format of the uh, data into the one that can be fit into hard on the loop test bed, that's also is the effort need to be considered. So hard, yeah, that's some, some experience that we find from our project. Yeah, that's, yeah, I think that is a common question, like how you convert different tools into like even a real-time software or even an EMT software. So as as you probably know that we are actually working on a Polarity side to have a, also a tool that can convert different softwares into HyperSIM, which is our EMT software, and maybe future into other softwares like eMegaSIM and maybe even eFizzaSIM between different software tools. So yeah, thanks. Thanks, Wei. Uh, next, I would... Go to uh, Dr. Moons, uh, Ulrika. I, I know you are working, and because we are working together, obviously, but with the Hawaii and this particular project. But what is your general experience? Again, I'm moving my question a little bit based on your presentation. What is your general experience when you have, you have this kind of futuristic controls and the scenarios that are very much future, futuristic, like 100% renewable and those kind of things? So. What do you see, like how is utilities acceptance on those kind of new ideas and how you kind of convince them that, yeah, this will work in the field in future? Yeah, this is a, <clears throat> this is a good question and it's actually a challenging one, right? So um, there are certain technologies, I would say that they, that are easier to implement everything, which is like receiving data and let's say monitoring is always easy to implement. 
The challenging part is really when you're closing the loop and when you send at least set points into the system, that's already the first part where it gets challenging. What we are doing in our project, we are not only changing set points, we're actually set changing controller parameters of the devices, right? So this is really something we discussed it with Hiko a few times. Um, there are different challenges, like do they actually even own those devices? Um, if they own them, does the manufacturer allow them to change those parameters? So there is quite there are some quite some some steps that we still have to go. Yeah. Um, on the other hand, we have to solve these problems, right? So we have to explore what is technically feasible, and then in the second step, say, well, if this is the only solution we see, then we have to talk either through regulations or other measures to make actually sure this is this is happening. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and what I also personally think, maybe when you we show this validation, right, like they believe their PSSE model, for example, now when you start showing it in a different software, like either Opalati or any other software, yeah. and compare with the current scenarios, I think they start getting a little bit more, I guess the utilities get more confidence, right, before they jump to the new things that probably you yes. need something. That, that was one very important part, of course, that at the beginning we showed both DOE, but also HECO, look, the model that you have given us and the model that we have created, which is now running in the real-time simulator, are actually behaving the same way. Yeah, okay, That's, that sounds great. And maybe I'll follow up the same thing to Devendra, like, uh, I know you are, you mentioned some of the product development and things that you are using the operative simulator. So. I'm just curious also, what is your experience on like the biggest challenges in the product development and validation that you see, especially when you deal with, again, the utilities or the integrators day in, day out, right? So what do you see the challenges and how think that you, how are you addressing those right now? Yeah, uh, with like uh, my, uh, I mean, uh, Dr. Munez, uh, uh, as well as uh, Dr. Sun mentioned about uh, that, uh, the biggest challenge uh, with respect to higher, I mean, we are talking about the products, that products which are going to address this higher penetration of uh, renewables, is that the actual modeling of the behavior of those devices themselves, which our controllers are going to uh, control, right? Uh, the actual power system modeling. Ability not only to model the power system, but also the behavior of those devices and then being able to emulate those uh, behavior and then doing that validation. Uh, see, it's, uh, I mean, <clears throat> grid is a large inertia machine, right? How do we, uh, how do we model those inertia at different levels? Uh, it all depends on whether the ER is owned by a customer, what kind of customer, what's the jurisdiction from the automation and control perspective, uh, so on, so forth, right? So all those things, uh, being able to model that as part of our uh, validation and verification process is very key. Before we can be very confident that, okay, uh, the solution is going to hold water uh, with respect to whatever the interconnection agreements are going to be, whatever the uh, atmosphere, uh, the regulatory deregulated atmosphere it is going to be subjected against. Uh, it could very well be uh, when we talk about the DERs, right? The DERs uh, from product management perspective for us, DERs are not only owned by the utilities. DERs most, most probably are going to be owned by uh, the industrial customers, uh, the commercial customers, uh, and those kind of things, right? So sky is the limit. How do you bring all those together into one single uh, platform and then uh, ability to simulate, test, and validate is what is the real challenge. And that's where I think uh, using the right tool sets, uh, using the right tool chains, uh, and using the right platform uh, at the get go for the, from the HIL simulation perspective is very key. And that's how we are getting, gaining the confidence by using the HIL technologies uh, uh, while we are releasing our products or uh, implementing our solutions to our customers, you know? so. That's where uh, yeah, I think. No, uh, no, that makes sense. Actually, that's that's yeah. That's what I was. Uh, I mean, so I was expecting because I was thinking that that may be the reason that people are using HIL. Especially, we are seeing more and more use of HIL now because of the system level need. Right? You cannot you can test easily one product in a lab, but when you are talking about a big system, then how are you going to test it? And and now everything is interconnected. So, yeah. Thanks, uh, Devendra and. 
Maybe I can maybe change a little bit the gear here and maybe ask a microwave related question to Dr. Wang. Uh, so uh, Dr. Wang, you are talking about different types of controllers and things like that. So do you see like there is a need for like more standardization of this microgrid controllers and then maybe also the validation? Like I know people validate it with uh, sometimes just with uh, simulation, sometimes with control hardware in the loop, sometimes with power hardware in the loop, sometimes with the test bed. So I was just wondering like, what is your take on that? Like, do you see the standardization will help in terms of the controller as well as the validation? Well, uh, yeah, I think you asked uh, several questions. So for controller itself, uh, I believe uh, from a function standpoint, uh, it's already quite standard. Uh, you know, when, when we develop our own, we survey the commercial product, other people's work. It seems there is a convergence on the functions for the controller. I, I listed the functions in, in our test bed. Uh, which pretty much uh, mimic uh, other standard ones, uh, minus a few uh, there. So from a function standpoint, I think so. Um, the difficulty really is uh, the, 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 the implementation, the hardware, and especially the one, uh, you know, what I'm working on that needs to talk to uh, the utility. Uh, SCADA uh, system, uh, the communication and those type of things. Uh, uh, you have some standard, but it's actually all over the place and taking a lot of effort uh, there. So it will be nice uh, if we can have some standardized approach. Uh, so that will save lots of uh, uh, development and deployment uh, effort, I believe. As far as the testing, um, well, I don't really see it's that much different from any other products. I mean, in all the industrial products, the one I'm familiar with, you always start with some kind of simulation, then you go to real-time simulation, you go to some kind of small-scale testing, then you go to the real, real validation. So I think those processes are already pretty standard, standardized. It should be followed. Uh, a lot of times people try to jump, right? So you go from one to the other. My students like to do that. They don't want like to do the, some of the testing or I think it's too hard and just want to go to final step. But in the end, I think what we are doing right now, I mean, everybody is explaining. I think this real-time simulation definitely is uh, very helpful and useful and probably necessary. Okay, I think that, yeah, that sounds great. And maybe we are actually start getting some questions in the Q&A, maybe before going there, just one, maybe last question to Ulrich. Uh, I know Ulrich, you, you also have a microgrid project. I think you didn't talk here, I think, but you are working on some connected microgrid. So I'm wondering like what you see in the research side of the microgrid, because I know even though you're from Siemens, you come more from the research side of the thing. So what do you see the research uh, needs, I guess the new research frontiers for the microgrid controls? Yeah, that's that's a good point. I mean, we have seen here two examples, right, from Fred and Devendra, what, what is ongoing in the microgrid. It is a hot market. It is fast growing right now. We are building many microgrids. Now, if you ask about really research, right, I mean, there is a lot of development. There's still many open questions how to optimize and, and operate and make more resilient single microgrids. But I think really the next big topic is how we connect actually microgrids, right? I mean, Wei, I think, was mentioning it slightly um, in, in one of his projects really how can we make network microgrids bring them all together and this is also the question you asked about scalability where this becomes very important uh, you're looking at one microgrid and, and again i don't want to say this is a simple or a solved problem it's not at all but when you think of it in 5 10 15 years we will have many of these microgrids we have to coordinate them and we have to of course also test those functions and simulate this so again um, scalable hard vendor loop simulation will be a core for this for this these developments that's yeah okay and is is there anything Devin, you want to add there or anyone else i guess just uh, this is our last question before we jump to our uh like the q a from the audience no, i think uh i uh, miss uh i agree with uh dr wang as well with dr wang uh, uh i mean the 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 most important part is uh, I mean, when we look at an individual microgrid versus when we look at uh, multiple microgrids, for example, a distribution utility uh, planning multiple 
substation level or feeder level microgrids? How are we going to network them together? How are we going to make sure that there is a protection coordination amongst them? How are we going to make sure that we are able to optimally, opti uh, optimally dispatch those uh, resources uh, where uh, it is not only meeting the need uh, for the microgrid uh, per se, but also how does it help uh, uh, from the utility operation perspective, right? Uh, when it is a grid-connected microgrid, uh, what takes precedence, whether it's the grid reliability uh, versus uh, the objective of the microgrid itself. It could be uh, maybe providing a critical power uh, to its uh, resources or uh, doing an economic uh, dispatch of its resources, right? So all those kind of things. How do we model? How do we manage those uh, uh, those behaviors? And how do we simulate those before we go uh, in the field and implement those? You know, and that's where uh, I mean, industry has to collaborate, and companies like Opel RT, in collaboration with industry and the utilities, uh, we all need to come together to uh, bring those solutions uh, to the table. Okay, that sounds great. So. Thank you again. And uh, I know there are several questions on the Q&A, but I think I mentioned in my earlier presentation, maybe you guys missed it. So I would like to have it more like a live feel on this. So if you want to ask a question, please raise your hand uh, in the chat screen or in your, uh, in your uh, screen, and then you can ask a question and I will unmute you so you can uh, ask a question. Please limit one question at a time because otherwise then not everybody will be able to ask a question. So. I see a few hands already up and we'll try to also answer some of the questions that are put in the chat window, but let's do this hand thing first, okay? So I see the first one from uh, Saeed uh, Ahmed. So Saeed, if you can uh, speak there. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. Uh, th thank you to the panelists for a very uh, insightful uh, discussion on microgrids. Uh, my question is regarding residential microgrids, when the customer becomes uh, sort of a presumer, like uh, he produces and consumes electricity also. So by combining like multiple customers in a microgrid, like are, is the industry looking into these types of microgrids also? So uh, anyone from the industry can answer this question. Thank you. Uh, Devendra or Ulrich, maybe you want to take that? <laughs> Uh, I would say that uh, when we talk about uh, uh, a community microgrid, uh, there have been pilots uh, in the United States and uh, uh, in Europe as well. Uh, I mean, community microgrid is really gaining a lot of traction these days, but uh, the challenge is the ownership of the resources, uh, the right of way for uh, controlling those resources and all those kind of things. Uh, but uh, I would say in uh, bits and pieces in various pockets, there have been pilot projects and POCs which are in works at this point of time uh, in different incarnations. Uh, are we there yet? Uh, may not be from the utilities perspective because there may be regulatory challenges, there may be business model questions and all those things. Uh, but as we get more and more uh, EVs that we get more and more uh, rooftop solar or the behind the meter storage and all, we are going to see a uh, lot of these uh, 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 concepts. Uh, the precursor is, for example, the residential demand response uh, participation into those kind of programs. Uh, there are some uh, very specific uh, programs which are being run in various parts of the country, uh, at least, for example, in Arizona, in California, and others, you know. Uh, Thanks, Devendra. So maybe we'll jump to the next question. Uh, Camilo, I know you typed some questions also, so maybe you can go and ask your question to Dr. Munas directly. Hello. Um, yep. Uh, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. So my question is to Professor Munz. In the Hawaiian microgrid, it was um, operated in isolated or connected to the grid? If, if connected was the case, they use a virtual impedance or PLL algorithm. Um, and the microgrid is in nature AC, DC, or both? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so this project, maybe there was not clear from my presentation. 
Uh, we looked at the complete transmission system of Huawei. It's not really a microgrid, I would say. Um, so it's we looked at the complete transmission systems. It has uh, 69 kV transmission lines um, around the island. Um, and so obviously it was it was islanded, it was isolated. Um, we had um, virtual impedance we did not use. We are still looking whether virtual impedance has a benefit or not, in particular in those modes where you have only one synchronous machine running or uh, really with serial inertia running. Okay. Thanks, Ulrich. Okay. So, Thanks. And then uh, go to the next question, Matt. Uh, I will allow you to talk. Uh, hi, Mark. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Excellent. Um, yeah, so I picked up the current recurring theme um, on interconnection interoperability. Just curious how um, IEEE 1547 uh, is adopted or influential in hardware and loop testing. And uh, is there a specific person you want to ask that, or is it general? Just, just general as a group. Okay. So maybe Wei maybe can answer because I know you are working on some of those. Yeah. So uh, the question is the how the actual standard to testing uh, consider that. Yeah, um, um, well, a little bit more background is that I think besides the actual 1547, there is also ongoing uh, act, looking at how uh, to put the distribution system provide service to the transmission. I know there's also working group on that. Um, yeah, very good question. I think uh, uh, right now, at least from our experiences, we try to, uh, since this is a, a guideline or rule, we try to, whenever we have just the communication uh, protocol standard protocol we try to comply with what what they developed but for our case it's more of more of uh, since we were not really focused on the microgrid maybe other panelists can can look in at we look in majority as how the distribution or group of microgrid provide service to transmission which is uh, on the standard side is uh, still open although their working group tried to ballot later this year uh, while we have working with uh, PNL also part of the working group to looking at what kind of additional item or rules can be added there. Uh, but I believe this is still, uh, some of panelists also mentioned, uh, so open questions, there's no standard, no rules. And then also the interoperability is, is also a concern. Some of the approach what we do is uh, using those uh, open FMB standards and to look at that, how does the uh, prescribed uh, um, uh, communication protocol that we can use when you're looking at different vendors. Uh, so that's some experience on our side. Yeah, and one thing I want to add because of my background before uh, uh, from 1547 and others, like some of those testing and other things, especially with hardware in the loop, initially was not part of 1547.1 because it was not as accepted by the utilities. But when he started doing this latest revision of 1547.1, uh, actually uh, there are a few tests now are allowed, especially because things are getting more system level. And you cannot like, you can do still UL type of testing for a single inverter, but people are getting more interested also like how they will work as a part of the system. So I think as a part of the future trend, there will be more and more hardware in the loop type of testing that will be coming as a part maybe of the standard or maybe as a recommended uh, as a standard, not like a mass testing, but as a recommended testing, especially things like microbit controller or the distribution ADMS, like advanced distribution management system type of controller and those type of things. That's my take, but maybe uh, we can jump to the next question. So by the way, we are almost on the hour, but I guess most of our panelists may stay a few extra minutes to answer all the questions because we have a few more questions, a few more hands. So, Good, uh, uh, so uh, we can I, I do need to leave. Uh, okay. <laughs> but so, uh, yes. I, I can I can say one word, one sentence about the last question. Sure. Yes, uh, our microgrid controller are tested per uh, 1547 as well as, well as uh, 2030.7.8. So we do need to follow some of these standards. Uh, thanks. I need to leave. Uh, thanks That's okay. Thanks, Dr. Wang. Yeah. And thanks for joining. And yeah, and people can still send the questions. Uh, that, so if you see some questions, we'll sure, let you. Sure, please. Yeah, my pleasure. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you so much. So maybe go to the next question to. Uh, by verb, uh, I will unmute you. Oops, sorry, I did something wrong. Give me one second. Yeah, can you uh, speak, by verb? 
Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yeah, so uh, you would, uh, thank you for the presentation to all the panelists. I'm uh, Vaibhu Oscar from University of Texas at Dallas. So since we were discussing about the multiple microgrids, I just wanted to know how is your thought process on when you're trying to control various microgrids, what are you trying to achieve first? Is it like we are trying to uh, emulate the previous controls which we had in our uh, system and then try to do it for the multiple microgrids? Or would it be some kind of a new approach which we need to think about? Maybe we'll read. <laughs> Yeah, this is a good question and, and a difficult to answer question, right? I mean, I work for an industrial research center, so we attempted to start with solutions that are closer to today's solutions um, and not start, starting from really radically, completely new approaches. Yeah? Um, so my approach would probably be to say, well, every microcontroller is controlling its microgrid. Uh, you have probably active and reactive power or maybe some, some sort of voltage control that you can offer to probably the medium voltage distribution system. And then you have multiple of these assets and try to coordinate them in the first step more on an active reactive power basis. So coordinating the power flow. Um, maybe also think about providing some sort of resilience, right? To say, okay, I have a storage in my microgrid so I can provide energy or power to other people or to other microgrids that have, that have a need, maybe a hospital or something like some critical loads. Um, if you more think about dynamic, like offering virtual inertia from a microgrid to the largest system, I think that's that's still many more years out if, if that will come. I'm not sure if those things would rather come from utility scale, either batteries or wind parks or something else. Yeah, yeah thank you. Can I just ask a, a quick question regarding the same? Uh, sure, go ahead. Maybe a short yeah, one. So, uh, so we have a few other people. That, yeah, go ahead. Uh, I just saw uh, a multi agent system in your slide. So, do you think that the multi agent system can also be extended to control multiple microgrids, or it would be more beneficial for just a, a single microgrid? Uh, is it for Ulrich also? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. Oh, I thought this was for me. <laughs> yeah, um, I, okay, go ahead. Uh, so we are usually not working with, um, depends what you define as a multi-agent system. Um, but I would say what we are doing is not a multi-agent system really. I mean, when you, what I described earlier, when you think of network microgrid and coordinating there, you have some sort of peer-to-peer -peer trading, which, which is a multi-agent system. So that's, that's true in the project, not the one I presented. Another project I have, we work with NREL together and NREL is developing a peer-to-peer -peer energy management. Um, we also have a project in Germany, colleagues of mine from Siemens that, that do peer-to-peer -peer trading. So this, this is something that goes in the direction of how to coordinate either multiple DRs inside a microgrid or coordinating multiple DRs. Yeah, yeah. and thanks Ulrich. And I don't know whose slide was, is that uh, way you have? I thought it was way, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. maybe probably, you can answer that, yeah, that maybe quickly. Yeah, although we're looking at the, uh, when you look at the large distribution system, you can do clustering, then you can do multi-agents. I believe uh, when you look at multi-microgrid, probably it's more complicated ownership, data exchange, and more, more hierarchical who you're talking to. It's, it's not just the multi-agent, it's more what data you're going to exchange. And uh, from the uh, research, point of view, definitely, yes. But from practical aspect, I think it's like a work of the mention. It's probably just not, not just multi-agent can solve all the problem. Okay, thanks, Wei. Okay. And thank you so much. And then I think it's kind of the last uh, hand I can see here is uh, Loknat. Uh, maybe I'll allow you to talk. Hello, could you hear me? Yes, we can. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, my question is to Dr. Ulrich uh, Munes. Uh, I have seen some grid forming controllers in your system for Hawaii Islands. And I would like to know for which uh, generation, whether it is PV or wind, is this uh, grid forming is adapted? Mm -hmm. yeah, that's a good question. The grid forming, and, and we're actually following what Hawaii is installing today, right? So I, I didn't mention this, but we are we take the system from Hawaii today and we had to extend it with additional utility scale wind and solar, sorry, solar and battery storage 
um, in order to, to meet this 100% um, inverter-based generation. But we were following what is the current extension planning of, of ECO, um, and the grid forming comes only from the batteries. Um, there is ongoing research whether you could do grid forming also with wind turbines. Oh no, actually there are grid forming wind turbines um, that have been tested in, in the UK from, from Siemens Gamesa, from uh, another company owned by Siemens. Um, and um, solar generation, also grid forming from PV uh, inverters, I haven't seen yet. There are ongoing research projects. We are part of one, actually together with Uwe. Uh, but uh, grid forming solar inverters, um, but I think that's not commercially available yet. So you can do wind turbines in our model, it's batteries. Um, and I think there was a question also about the size of these batteries. So it is, I would say oversized. So the total is we have four 30 megawatt battery inverters in the system, which gives you 120 megawatt of grid forming capacity. Um, the numbers were not built or designed to make it as small as possible, but it's just what we said, okay, let's, let's look what Hawaii is planning to install over the next few years, and that's what we built. Um, we have a work package where we are trying to analyze what is the smallest amount of grid forming that you actually need in order to stabilize the system, but this is still ongoing, so I cannot tell you what's, what's the outcome of this. My, my gut feeling tells me 120 megawatt for a 200 megawatt um, system is probably... Not, not what you need, you could do with less. Yeah, and uh, one more short question. Uh, have you tested the black start capability of the system with grid forming? This is just simulated, right? It's not a real system. Um, okay. And no, we haven't, we, we, it, we usually start it basically as it's running. You have an initial condition and then start the simulation. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Sure. Thank, thank you, Ulrich. And uh, I think there is a, one question on the chat, but I would ask if you can speak up. I don't know if you have a mic or not, but uh, K. Sujita, uh, if you can ask your question, that's kind of the last question I can see on my side. You have a question? Yeah, about... yeah. Just one Sorry. thing, I will have to jump to uh, another okay. meeting. So okay. thank you very much for your time. Uh, really appreciate the opportunity to talk. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. And uh, I guess maybe uh, Sujita, you may, we can answer your question later, I guess, because it's a very general question. So uh, maybe for sake of time, maybe we can wrap this up again. Thank you very much for everybody uh, joining this, uh, this particular panel. And uh, as you probably know uh, already, but this, all this will be recorded. Uh, so we have the recorded panel presentation and you can access them till, uh, I guess, October 17th, so a month. And, and also just before we go, I like to thank again, our, all our panelists because everybody is busy. So they take their time to join this panel and talk about their exciting work. And for the, for the attendees, uh, please don't forget there are all other exciting panels and presentations going on. So uh, please uh, join as many as you can possible in live or you can also get them recorded later. So thank you again. And with that, I will close this panel. Thank you and have a good day. Bye. Thank you very much, Sudipta. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.